Hello beautiful people, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jade Sala and this is the second episode of my property buying series. So if you haven't seen the first episode, I'm going to link it somewhere below. So please go and watch that. So today I've decided to share like some of the things that I have used to prepare myself to buying my first investment property. And without wasting time, let's just get into it. So the first thing to do if you're thinking of buying an investment property is to educate yourself. Like I can't overemphasize the education part of just trying to figure out what sort of investment strategy you want to get into with regards to uh, buying an investment property and there are different types. So you could be doing like a regular buy to let where it's like a single let. So you buy a property and then you, you know, rent it out to a single tenant. It could be an individual, it could be a family, but it's a single tenant that is paying the monthly rent or the annual rent for the property. You could decide to go for like HMO, so house of multiple occupancy. You probably need a license to be able to operate that. So where you are able to rent out, uh, each room in the property to different tenants, right? So if it's a three bedroom property, for example, you could rent out one room for say thousand pounds, another room for 800 pounds, another room, you know, for 1,200 pounds right? So you're renting out each room. Uh, people would usually maybe have like a common area where they would share together. They would probably share toilets or kitchen, or they could be in suits. That may be like your strategy. To Another strategy that you could look at could be the holiday led service accommodation strategy, where you buy a property and then you list it on platforms like Airbnb or booking.com and rent it out per night. Uh, this, as far as I know, is one of the most lucrative strategies. So depending on, you know, what you decide as your strategy, and there's so many other strategies, then that could be what you want to do. But one of the things is you want to educate yourself. You want to learn as much as possible, uh, about each of these strategies, because with each one comes its pros and cons, and then decide on which one you want to settle for. Because once you've educated yourself and figured out the investment strategy that you want to go for, you can then now start to think of what kind of property would work for this kind of strategy. So for example, if you want to do HMO, you can't be thinking of buying like a one bed property or a studio. It's not just going to make sense for that kind of investment strategy. You want to look at maybe getting a property that is maybe like a two bed or three bed or four bed or that you can even maybe get like a two bed, but you can convert it into a three bed. It's those kind of things that you want to think about when you're thinking about HMO. If you're thinking about a single let, it probably maybe would not really matter what type of property it is. Uh, but if you also maybe have like a, like a rental yield, you're thinking about, it may inform the kind of property that you're going to get. If you're thinking of going into like service accommodation, you would have to think about the kind of property that would work for that as well. Uh, flats work a lot. Houses work as well in some locations. So depending on what you decide, then you can figure out the type of property that would work for the strategy that you have identified. The next thing you now want to think about is budget. So how much money do you want to spend on buying an investment property? So your budget goes a long way in determining the type of property you can buy, the location you can buy it in, how much your overall cost is going to be in terms of like all associated costs, from stamp duty, which is usually like a percentage of the property you're buying, uh, to even how you set up the property. Your budget is what is going to determine all of this. And it's important that you have like, maybe not an exact amount, but you have like a, you know, a ballpark amount or an estimated amount that you want to spend on your investment. So the next thing you want to think about is how you then want to buy. Do you want to buy with cash or do you want to buy with mortgage? I can tell you buying with cash is like the easiest thing. Nobody's asking you any questions, <laughs> right? But you have to come up with a hundred percent of the money 
and if you decide to go with a mortgage it means that you're going to get a lender to finance a part of the property price in the uk you're required to have at least minimum 25 percent of your own money and then the lender is going to come up with the balance for you in order for you to be able to buy the property so you really need to decide which one you want to use and if you decide to choose to use cash you have to be thinking about how do you want to raise the entire fund you may already have it you may want to partner with different people you may want to maybe uh get investors whatever you decide right you want to think about how you want to raise the cash and if it is um a mortgage as well you still need to decide how you want to raise the deposit as well uh it could be from your savings. It could be from friends and family. It could be that you want to take on an extra job, whatever it is that you want to do, you need to really think about how you want to raise those monies. And then you start to save, or you just get to work by talking to different people. If you want to get money off of people. So you want to start to get your funds ready. So once you've sorted out, like how you want to raise the money as you're saving, you now want to think about uh if you want to buy in your personal name or you want to buy in a business name like i am doing i'm trying to buy a property in my company name and it's important for you to weigh all the options for yourself and determine if buying in your personal name is good for you versus buying in your business name or whichever one suits you the most if you're buying in your name it's much easier, right? Than if you're buying in your company name. However, you would pay personal income tax in the same percentage as whatever income that you're currently earning. So if you are already say in like a 40% bracket or 45% bracket in the UK, for example, any additional income that you're earning is going to be taxed at those kind of rates versus if you're buying in your company name, you pay what they call corporation tax, which is taken out um, after all your expenses. So you want to decide which one you want to go for. If you're buying in your personal name, you probably don't need to do anything. Uh, but if you want to buy in a business name, you want to register your business. It takes about maybe 12 pounds and in less than, I don't know, depending on how fast or how slow you are, you could complete the form in like 15, 20 minutes and then your company is registered. And once you've completed the registration, you want to open a business account. Now, I personally had some challenges trying to open a business account. Sometimes, especially if you're trying to open an account with like a, a mainstream bank, they may go through a lot of processes, but if you're opening with say a digital bank, you could get your account opened almost immediately and just make sure that you register the business and open an account for it. And this is because if you are trying to buy in your company name, you need to apply for a mortgage in your company name versus if you're trying to buy your personal name, the application is going to be done in your personal name and yeah all these things are going to be needed. Uh, your accounts are going to be needed to show the history of your deposit or how the business is doing. The next thing you want to do is then to go mortgage broker shopping. Now, this is one of the most vital things that you have to do in this process. And what I mean by, you know, going <laughs> mortgage broker shopping, is you're trying to speak to as many mortgage advisors as you can. You want a situation whereby you give yourself the best chance at working with someone who understands your situation. For example, for people who are not yet permanent residents in the, in the UK, for example, there would be mortgage brokers that are used to dealing with people who are on visas in the UK and want to buy a property. If you're a permanent resident or you're a British citizen, yeah, you can have like the vanilla mortgage advisors. But for someone like me that I'm a first time buyer, first time landlord, I'm on the visa and I'm also trying to buy in my company name. I knew that I needed to go with a specialist mortgage broker uh, from the get go, because when I was doing my research, I realized that my situation is not very straightforward. It doesn't fit into 
like the um the kind of cases that a lot of you know lenders are used to and they'll probably have maybe a specialist department or a specialist lender that can handle it and you want to go with a broker that has handled your situation before or is knowledgeable about the peculiarities around your situation and can best position you to accessing a mortgage if that's what you're going to do and like i said you want to speak to as many brokers as you can it doesn't cost you a dime to speak to as many people as you can send them whatever documents they ask you to send so that they can profile you um and only pay the mortgage broker that you want to go with there's some mortgage brokers that are actually free because they would get uh paid by the lender others may charge you a small fee in my opinion anybody charging you more than 500 pounds as a mortgage broker is trying to rip you off <laughs> just that's just my personal opinion anyways uh, usually they charge between 200 and 500. Uh, so you only need to pay the person you're going with. And there's some people that may even tell you that you don't need to pay unless they are applying for the mortgage for you. Uh, some may require you to pay the money upfront and just, you know, sign an agreement with them. And then you work with them till you secure a property. Uh, but one of the things that you want to do with the person you're going for is to try and get an agreement in principle. This agreement in principle, in my opinion, is just something that empowers you when you're speaking with estate agents. It just shows that you're serious. It doesn't confirm that the lender is going to lend to you or approve your mortgage by the time you're doing a proper ap application. So basically the mortgage advisor has just imputed like a high level information uh, about you into a system. So this is how much you earn. This is how long you've been in the country. This is the type of property you're looking for. This is the property price. This is how, you know, and hey, the agreement in principle just says, yes, we can lend you this amount of money or yeah, we can go ahead if you get a property. It's something like that. So it just empowers you when you want to put an offer on a property. It makes an estate agent value your offer and prioritize you as someone who's ready to go as opposed to someone who's just trying to, you know, get a property, get an offer, and then is now looking for a lender. So that's the part about like shopping for a mortgage advisor, making sure you select the right person and getting an agreement in principle where you can. Now there's some situations where some specialist lenders may not issue an agreement in principle, but your mortgage advisor may be able to write you a letter that you can present to estate agents just to give them that same uh, comfort that you're actually a serious buyer. So the next thing you want to do once you've sorted out your mortgage agreement in principle is that you also want to, you know, get quotes from solicitors that can help you with your conveyancing so conveyancing is like the process of transferring like the property from the seller to the buyer and you need a lawyer to help you with that process so get as many quotes as you can from different uh solicitors you can just check online or if you know people who have used certain solicitors in the past you can just check and get quotes as well and then decide on who you want to engage so the next thing you want to do is now to start viewing properties but my advice is don't wait till your deposit is complete before you start to view properties there's something that viewing properties going to the location where you're interested in what it does for you it just puts you in that you know mind frame of you know a property investor and you're learning about the area you're learning about the type of properties that are there because what i've seen is that in this uk like the certain areas that have like the same type of properties and you start to learn about the things you like, the things you don't like, you learn to, you know, discuss confidently with estate agents. You can even learn to even like play around with, you know, putting an offer on a property. Uh, but just in case your offer gets accepted, <laughs> you know, you have to be ready. But anyways, uh, you want to make sure that you are viewing properties and you're viewing as many properties as you can you know go online uh register with you know right move zoopla on the market and then they will be sending you properties that fit within the criteria that you set and then you can go and be viewing some of these properties 
it's just something that helps with your mindset. It just puts you in that, you know, property investor mindset. Um, and it helps a lot. It would give you a lot of motivation to continue to save and to continue to raise the capital that you need in order to buy a property. So these are some of the things that I've gone through myself to prepare myself to buy an investment property. I hope you've learned something from this video and I will be sharing a lot more about my property buying journey in my next video. See you next time. Bye.